very much for joining us, uh, Rafe. We are very happy to have you here uh, for a presentation of your book, uh, The Great Demarcation, The French Revolution and the Invention of Modern Property. Rafe Blofarb is the director of the Institute on Napoleon and the French Revolution at the Florida State University. And he will explain to us today uh, how the French Revolution remade the system of property holding. So in a nutshell, what does it mean to own something? What sort of things can be owned and what should be considered maybe as common good or at least not be owned? Uh, before giving the floor to Thomas Piketty for a short introduction, a quick word on the debates. The Debates on Equality uh, is a cycle of conferences that is dedicated to the presentation of uh, books published in social sciences with the objective of fostering uh, the debate, the public debate on inequality issues. So the next debate uh, is gonna take place on the 31st of March and will be in English as well. Marlene Banquet and Théo Bourgeron will be presenting their book, Accumulating Capital Today, which I think is gonna be a good uh, continuation of the presentation today. And on April the 12th, we'll have the presentation of the book Political Cleavages and Social Inequality, uh, written by Thomas Piketty, Amory Geffen, and Clara Martinez Toledano. So a book published by uh, the World Inequality Lab members. The program of the debates is available on wid.world, wid.world. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Olivia. So I'm, I'm going to give the floor to Raph Blofarb. Let me simply say that this is, of course, you cannot read it this way, I don't know, anyway. This is a great demarcation, the French Revolution and the invention of modern property. This is really a, a fantastic book, at least, you know, I have, uh, you know, I've learned uh, enormously by reading this book. To me, this is really one of the best book uh, uh, ever written on the French Revolution, which is a topic on which, of course, there is a lot of books. But I think this one also, maybe because it's written by someone who is a bit further away from the French Revolution uh, than us, and, and, you know, we know the French Revolution has been instrumentalized a lot in the French debate in the past two centuries, and, and maybe Raph has enough... Uh, sort of uh, intellectual distance to be able to show us uh, things that, that uh, in my view, people didn't see before, in particular, the complexity of the task of uh, you know, inventing new forms of property relation. What I really love in this book, and I'm going to stop there, is the fact that we, uh, you know, we feel some empathy for, for the different actors, you know, including the very cons conservative actors. And you know, I think it's good to know your enemy, or at least to know the various viewpoints. You know, if we want to move to something less conservative, it's important to understand that there are some deep uh, issues. And, and you know, it's, it's complicated to reorganize property. We've seen that in the 20th century, but it was also like this in the 18th century. It's not so simple. And, and, uh, and this is something we, we I think feel the complexity of this in this book very well. I know that Raf also wants to talk to us about his more recent research. And of course, Raf, you do what you want in your presentation, but don't forget that some people may not have read uh, this fantastic book and, and probably want to learn a little bit at least about it. So I leave it to you. You do what you want. Uh, so we have about, we have one hour 30. You can talk for an hour, a bit less, a bit more you know, so that we have questions at the end, but of course, don't restrain yourself if you need a bit more, you know, do what you feel you want to do. And uh, thanks a lot for being here uh, today. Thank, thank you so much for that, that really kind introduction. Um, uh, being able to say something meaningful about the French Revolution to French people is, is actually very, very important to me because um, France and its history is very much the country of my adoption. Um, I, I fell in love with it when I was a teenager. And uh, <laughs> I still, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit more realistic about, about, about it, but I love, I love the country very much and I wish I could be there. But I'm, I'm very, very happy to be able to be with you um, uh, today uh, virtually uh, by Zoom. Um, Toma uh, originally invited me to come uh, present this work on March 18th, 2020, which as you know, 
was very bad timing because that is pretty much when the world began to realize that COVID was a pandemic. And we, we had to take the decision on the spur of the moment last year uh, to, uh, to, to postpone my trip. Well, it's a year later. Um, uh, uh, we're still not together in person, but I'm very, very happy to be here uh, virtually to present, uh, to present my work to you. Um, so before I get really into the, the work itself, I'd like to tell you first two really important basic things about the book. The first thing is, what is the book about? And the second thing is, what does my book argue? And uh, to do this, I, I can actually rely on the two titles of my book, the French title and the English title. So here you see uh, my French title, The Invention of Property. That's what my book is about. My book discusses, it's a history book, it discusses the history of how the French Revolution went about inventing or remaking or transforming, if you will, um, uh, property, creating modern property. That's what the book is about. What is the argument? The argument is that in the process of creating this new kind of property, or rather through the creation of this new kind of property, the French revolutionaries enacted what I call the great demarcation. That is a demarcation, a distinction um, between the idea of property on the one hand and the idea of power on the other. This conceptual distinction between property and power that I call, that I call the great demarcation uh, was translated by the French revolutionaries and their successors into laws and institutions um, that, uh, that, that are with us today that govern uh, the modern world and modern ways of, uh, 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 of, of analyzing our, our place in it. Okay. So let me tell you uh, about the research and, and then go through the, uh, the argument of the book. I began this research in, in the year 2012, uh, and I began it with a, uh, with, a, with a hypothesis, a starting assumption. That assumption, as it turned out, was completely false, totally wrong. What I thought was that in order to make a new system of property, all the French revolutionaries had to do was to, um, was to um, clear away, um, to, uh, to, to strip away the overgrowth of feudal, uh, archaic, vestigial, strange, bizarre forms of property that, uh, that had persisted since the Middle Ages. The idea was that the French revolutionaries' creation of a modern regime of property was actually uh, what, I, there was what I would call in French a, a, a debroussaillage operation, a kind of brush clearing, a kind of stripping away of the jungle. My, my thought was, my assumption was that once the French revolutionaries cleared away all of the archaic, feudal, gothic, trappings, all of the bizarre forms of property left over from the past, there would be revealed underneath normal, natural, modern property, Lockean property. However, what I found as I looked into this is that if one were to clear away all of the Bruce if one were to clear away all of these vestigial, bizarre, archaic forms of property, there would be nothing left underneath. There wasn't anything but Bruce. Bruce was the system. Uh, the jungle was the system. There was no modern property underneath. So that changed my, uh, that changed my approach. Um, and it raised a new question. The question was no longer how did the French revolutionaries clear away old regime property to reveal modern property underneath, but it became how did the French revolutionaries um, take an existing system of property and completely transform it and invent, invent a new kind of property, invent a new kind of uh, property regime. 
So my first step was to try to understand the old regime of property that the French revolutionaries found in 1789. Um, looking at that system of property, I came to the conclusion that it had a logic and it had an essence. The essence of old regime property, uh, in my opinion, was the confusion, the imbrication of, of what we would today consider to be two distinct categories, the categories of property on the one hand and power on the other. The essence of old regime property was to make no distinction between property or power. Uh, property was power, power was property, you could own power and, uh, and power conveyed property ownership. Uh, the two were completely blended, inextricably uh, uh, mixed together. So this confusion of property and power uh, that, 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 uh, that, that, that I contend is, is the essence of old regime property had two principal manifestations in practice. The first was the private ownership of public power. That is, individuals could own public authority as a form of private property. The second characteristic of this confusion was um, a, a notion of ownership that, uh, that was uh, quite different from our own. It was a notion of ownership that was hierarchical and shared divided ownership. To put it another way, no one in the old regime owned a piece of land fully and independently. Rather, people held pieces of land uh, in conjunction with other people. Every piece of land had multiple owners, and those pieces of land were strung together in hierarchical chains of domination and dependence. So let me talk a little bit more about both of these two characteristics, these two manifestations of old regime property. First was the private ownership of public power. There were two principal ways that individuals could own public power, could own public authority. The first way was in the seigneury. The seigneury was um, jurisdictional lordship. It was, if you owned a seigneury, in the most technical sense, you owned the right of justice over the people who lived within, uh, within the jurisdiction of that seigneury. Um, often the jurisdiction of that seigneury corresponded to the territorial limits of a property holding that I'm gonna talk about in a second called a fief. And in fact, the fief and the seigneury were often coterminous and owned by the same person, that a, a seigneur, a jurisdictional seigneur, was also the feudal lord of the fief and exercised justice and territorial superiority together at the same time. However, this was not necessarily the case. The seigneury and the fief were different things. The seigneury was, 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 uh, uh, was uh, to be very precise, simply the right of justice, and it could be detached. It could be detached from the land holding the fief that it was usually um, that it was usually associated with. In fact, the seigneury, the right of justice, could be uh, could be uh, bought and sold like any other piece of real estate even though it was incorporeal and was not a piece of real estate in our modern sense, and it could be subdivided. So there are seigneuries in France before the revolution that have a dozen or more uh, co-seigneurs. Um, seigneury justice, the right of administering criminal and civil justice was a partable, vendable, commercializable form of property in the old regime. You could own public power just like you could own a house through ownership of a seigneury. Now, the second, the second type of public power, the second way that someone could own public power as private property was through, uh, was through the purchase of a public office. In France before the revolution, tens of thousands of public offices, things we would now consider, you know, elective or bureaucratic offices 
were, uh, were for sale. They were for sale. They were bought and sold on the open market. They could be passed down in the family, these public offices. Uh, so they could be inherited. They could form part of marriage dowries. You could take loans out against the collateral of the office you had purchased. These, 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 these offices known as venal offices were extremely common in France. Um, they ranged in type. There were very minor offices, local municipal offices um, that, uh, that involved fairly menial functions. Um, but then there were also extremely grand prestigious offices. Probably the most prestigious offices of all were the, uh, were the, were the uh, justices, were the, were the magisterial offices in the highest courts of the land, in the parlement, the sovereign courts. All of the magistrates in the sovereign courts owned venal offices. They had purchased their magisterial position or had inherited it. A good example is the famous Baron de Montesquieu. He inherited uh, a venal office in the Parlement of Bordeaux. And he and many other people uh, were in that position. I'm not gonna go through the whole range of offices, but just to say that if you had enough money in France, you could buy a very powerful public office that con conveyed quasi-sovereign functions, such as the right to, uh, to um, inflict capital punishment on criminal defendants. Um, OK, so much for the private ownership of public power. Uh, what, about, uh, what about real estate itself, the divided hierarchical framework of real estate? In, in France before the revolution, no one, except for one person who I'll talk about at the end, but basically no one actually owned property in the sense that we think of ownership. People held property. They held property from a superior who had granted them a parcel of property. In return for that grant of property, that you had received, you would pay that superior, often a feudal lord, you would pay that superior various kinds of dues and services and rents. Your right to the property that had been granted to you, your right to the property that, 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 that you held from that lord was considered a real property right, but it wasn't a, a, an independent absolute property right. It was a property right that you shared with the Lord because the Lord in granting you that property retained a property right of his own over that same portion of property. Um, that right was variously called a right of superiority, a right of regard, uh, but whatever you call it, that right of, uh, of lordship, that superior property right was a property right just as much as the right that you, the tenant, had to cultivate and exploit the land. What that means is that every piece of real estate in France, basically, every piece of real estate in France before 1789 had at least two owners. It had a dependent owner who held the property and actually lived on it and exploited it. And it had a superior owner, the Lord, who had granted the property, but reserved various rights over, over that property. This, this basic structure of um, a Lord granting property to a dependent uh, was reproduced in a kind of hierarchical chain um, from, from the very bottom of, uh, of French society all the way to the top. At the bottom were mainly peasants who held their property from lords. Those peasants were in a purely dependent position. They held their property from lords, owed those lords various kinds of rents and services and obligations, but those peasants themselves did not have anyone under them. The lords, the people who granted the property, um, they themselves were often found themselves in, in, in multi-layered hierarchies of lordship. So a lord who granted a, a peasant property might himself 
find that his fief, that his land holding, um, had been granted by a higher lord. And that higher lord might be holding his, uh, his uh, land from an even higher lord. So most people, most people we would call property owners in France before 1789 found themselves in simultaneously a position of superiority as lords, but also dependence, dependence on higher lords. Most people were, were both superiors and dependents at the same time, at least most property owners. Only one person in France was a true, what we would call a true owner. Only one person in France was in a purely superior position who didn't hold his property from anybody. And that was the king. The king held his property from no one or possibly from God, but the king was not dependent on anyone else. Rather, everyone was ultimately dependent on the king. Everyone ultimately, either directly or indirectly, held their property from the king. Thus, you could say that, that really this is not a system of property at all. It's a property, it's a system of hierarchical holding. It's a system of hierarchical tenure. And if you wanna talk about ownership in the sense of an absolute property right to something, well, really the only owner in France before 1789 is the crown, is the king. And interestingly, just an aside, um, England today observes exactly that same principle. In England right now, the only person who enjoys the legal status of full ownership is uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Everyone else holds their property uh, indirectly or directly uh, from, from, the, from the crown. And that's the way France was like uh, before, uh, before the revolution. Okay. Sorry, Rafe, I, I have yeah. a question. You, you yeah, mean please for, interrupt. For, for real estate and land, right? You're not, talk, you're not talking about financial assets, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And I, I, I should make this very clear. I'm talking about uh, what we would call immobilier. Um, these rules do not apply to mobilier. Uh, they, do not, uh, they do not apply to, to most kinds of financial assets. There are certain kinds of financial assets like uh, ground rents, like rente foncière, because those are rents, financial instruments derived from land, they are considered legally to have the status of, of immeuble. But, but by and large, financial instruments are, are and, and mobile property and jewels and paintings and books, that doesn't apply to, that's not what I'm talking about at all. That's a great question. I, and you've, you've caught out one of the weaknesses of my book, which is I'm only looking at immeuble. I'm not looking at meuble at all. That would require a whole, a whole other book and it would be, a, a, I think, a, a really good book um, to have. Thanks for that question. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I've just described this system of old regime property based on the confusion of property and power uh, a system that allowed the private ownership of, of, of public power and that when it came to the ownership of real estate uh, involved hierarchical chains of domination and dependence that themselves tended to replicate and produce uh, power relations. Um, this system was not without its enemies and critics. And I talk about a number of different um, uh, different types of criticism leveled against this system in, 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 in the book. But, uh, but today I just wanna talk about, uh, uh, about what I consider to be the most important um, source of criticism. Um, this was the criticism leveled by the lawyers, the criticism leveled by legal scholars uh, at, that, at, at this system of confusion, the system where property and power are intermingled. Um, I want to mention three jurists. Um, the first is uh, a jurist called uh, Charles Dumoulin. He is, he is active in the first half of the 16th century. He is an absolutist. Uh, he wants to see the power of kings um, solidified, and he wants to see the competing power of feudal lords 
um, put down. And to do that, he goes after, he goes after um, seigneurial prerogatives. He goes after the quasi-sovereign powers of seigneurs. And particularly, he goes after seigneurial justice, this, this right of justice that lords own as a private property. For Dumoulin, this is an aberration. In fact, it's a usurpation. And he calls it that uh, quite directly. He says, the lords of France have usurped this power from, from the crown. Um, and to try to distinguish, to try to separate out that power of justice, that seigneurial power from, uh, from the realm of legitimate property, Dumoulin makes a, an important distinction that will enter into the canons of French law. Uh, it's a simple pithy saying. He says, thief and justice, the thief and justice have nothing in common. That just because you're a feudal lord and you're also a seigneurial lord and you have the right of justice, that doesn't mean that the thief and the justice are the same thing. The thief for Dumoulin, the land holding, is legitimate. The justice that the seigneur exercises is an illegitimate usurpation of royal sovereignty. Thief and justice have nothing in common. They're separable. And what Dumoulin would ideally like to do is recover all the justice from the lords of France and reconcentrate that judicial power um, in the unique hands of the crown. Doesn't happen. It's going to take the French Revolution to do that. Uh, but, but the idea is already out there. The second jurist I want to talk about is better known, I think, to social scientists. It's Jean Baudin. And I got a little quote for you fr fr from him. Um, Jean Baudin, uh, obviously, he, he, wrote, uh, he wrote this book, Les Six Livres de la République. This is a book uh, that is famous for articulating a new uh, vision of sovereignty, a vision of sovereignty that, uh, that stands apart from older notions of sovereignty as, uh, as kind of lordly proprietary power or, or a seigneurial jurisdictional right. For, for Baudin, royal sovereignty has nothing in common. It should have nothing in common with, with the powers of a lord. It should be Sovereignty, royal sovereignty for Baudin should be absolute and unique and should be shared by no one else in the country except the king. Um, and he, in his chapter on sovereignty, he, 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 certainly the most famous chapter in the book, he articulates this new uh, absolute conception uh, of sovereignty. Um, but I want to point your attention to something here in the quote. Um, it's this, that when Baudin begins to speak about sovereignty, and particularly when he begins to speak, like focus more intently on sovereignty, look at the language that he uses. To speak about sovereignty, he has to rely on and very heavily rely on the language of property. Here, this is just a little quote where um, Baudin is comparing the powers of a subordinate magistrate to the, the power of a sovereign king. Um, and, and, and I'll just start from here. Um, he reads, he, he writes, l'un est prince, l'autre est sujet, l'un est seigneur, l'autre est serviteur. L'un est propriétaire et saisi de la souveraineté. L'autre n'est ni propriétaire ni possesseur d'Isel et ne tient rien qu'en dépôt. This, this, this uh, statement is important because it shows that in order to make his argument about sovereignty, to talk about sovereignty, Baudin ends up using the language of property, in fact, the language of a notarial contract. Here we have, first of all, the word seigneur, which, in, in, which means ownership of property as well as jurisdictional lordship. We have the word propriétaire. We have saisie, which is a legal, uh, a legal property law term from old regime France. 
il y a propriétaire, possesseur, tient, dépôt. The point about this is that even though Baudin has a very clear notion in his mind of the separation that he wants to make between sovereignty and property, he finds himself reintroducing proprietary language into his discussion of sovereignty because language itself incarnates the confusion of property and power that is at the essence of the old regime constitution. In, in other words, language is the problem. You'll never be able to really separate property and power uh, until you come up with a new way of talking about them, a way that doesn't constantly reintroduce the confusion that you're trying to dispel. So the third lawyer I'm going to talk about, um, uh, Charles Loiseau, and here he comes, he did just this. Loiseau, who is in some ways the hero of my book, he's an amazing analytical mind. Um, Loiseau decides that in order to clarify the situation, he is going to tackle the confusion inherent in language itself. He is going to come up with a new way of talking about seigneurie that makes a distinction between seigneurie as property ownership and seigneurie as public power. And, and how he does this, he simply divides the concept, the term of seigneury into two parts. And I'll read this for you because I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is to read this, this old writing, but, but this is from Loiseau's Traité des Seigneuries. Here he is uh, talking about his division. Quant à, quant à sa division, la seigneurie a deux espèces, à savoir la seigneurie publique et la privée. La publique consiste en la supériorité et autorité qu'on a sur les personnes ou sur les choses. The key here is seigneurie publique, that's going to become public power, public authority. It consists in superiority and authority, and especially over persons. In contrast, la seigneurie privée, c'est la vraie propriété et jouissance actuelle de quelque chose, et est appelée privée parce qu'elle concerne le droit que chacun particulier a en sa chose. Donc, Le seigneur qui a la seigneurie publique a pour son relatif le sujet et celui qui a la seigneurie privée l'esclave. That's, I think that, that, that's brilliant. I mean, you can own a thing. If you have seigneurie privée, that's ownership. And if you own, if you, if you, if you try to exercise seigneurie privé, ownership over a person, you now have a slave. The proper kind of seigneurie to exercise over people in a free country is seigneurie publique, um, authority, uh, jurisdiction, uh, but not the power of ownership. So Loiseau tries to solve the problem of the linguistic confusion of property and power by making a uh, demarcation, really his own great demarcation within the concept of seigneury itself, a concept, a word that had been used, that had been used before 1789 to refer both to ownership of, of a piece of property as well as um, uh, jurisdiction uh, and authority over people. I should say, just to interrupt myself here, that the word the word that the revolutionaries will popularize to speak of, uh, uh, of property um, isn't really used much during the old regime. After 1789, uh, people will speak about propriété and propriétaire. Before 1789, the word is very, very rare. Um, instead, you talk about seigneurie. You're the seigneur of something. If you own a piece of land, you say, je suis le seigneur de, de and whatever. 
you don't say je suis propriétaire. Um, that is what the revolution uh, will, uh, will bring about. Okay, turning to the revolution. As, as you all know, um, the, the leading French revolutionaries, in fact, the largest single professional grouping among the deputies in the National Assembly was, uh, was lawyers. Uh, most of the deputies of the Third Estate, the most politically active uh, radical members of the assembly um, were, were lawyers by training. Some of them were extremely accomplished lawyers as well. And that's important because they bring into the revolution, these deputy lawyers of the third estate, they bring into the revolution concepts, ideas, and a vision of a demarcated world that they had learned um, in their law books that they had learned from people like Dumoulin, Baudin, and Loiseau. In other words, there is a, a legal culture. There's a culture of lawyers that becomes in many ways the culture of the third estate uh, in the National Assembly when it begins to undertake the remaking, uh, remaking of France. And um, the deputies of the third estate uh, are going to begin to put their ideas of demarcation into practice uh, as, soon as, as soon as they get the opportunity. And that opportunity comes uh, for them in early August um, 1789, to be precise, on the night of August 4th, 1789. In the days running up, in the days preceding that, that dramatic nighttime session of August 4th, Huge parts of rural France had uh, had 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 seen a, a massive massive wave of rural uh, unrest, unlike unlike anything France had known since the Jacqueries of centuries before. The, these waves of rural unrest uh, are known uh, are known today as the Great Fear. These are these are the great movements that led to the burning of chateaus, the destruction of seigneurial records by peasants across much uh, of France. Word of the, of, of the great fear, word of these disturbances in the countryside begin to reach the National Assembly in early August. And on, on the night of August 4th, deputies uh, decide to, um, to take preemptive action. What they, what they try to, what they decide that they're gonna have to do to regain control over the situation is to grant immediate concessions to the peasants who are in fact going to war against feudalism in their villages across, uh, across the countryside. So what the deputies do on the night of August 4th is quite dramatically uh, renounce their feudal dues. They renounce uh, the collection of feudal dues and prerogatives. And as they famously decree, we'll see that decree right now, in fact, uh, the feudal regime uh, is entirely uh, destroyed. Uh, this is the famous night of August the 4th. And here's the first article. L'Assemblée Nationale détruit entièrement le régime féodal. In addition to that, the deputies abolish a number of other uh, irritate, feudal irritations, different kinds of feudal prerogatives that bothered peasants, that, that, that interfered with their crops, or that were humiliating and demeaning. Now, many historians have looked at the night of August 4th that abolishes the feudal regime as no more than a reaction no more than a kind of emergency response by the panicked deputies to the destruction of, of property uh, in the countryside. Now, there is a lot to that. There's no doubt that the deputies who were men of property, they did not really like uh, seeing thousands and thousands of peasants uh, destroying stuff uh, across the French countryside, no doubt about it. But I, I argue in the book that the night of August 4th is more than simply a, a response to peasant rebellion. Um, I believe that on that night, the deputies take advantage of, the, of, of, this, of this crisis situation to introduce much more sweeping reforms uh, 
that actually have nothing at all to do with, um, with the countryside and that actually have nothing to do with feudalism either. What, I, what, what my argument is in the book is that if you, if you look at the articles, uh, if you look at the things that are suppressed on the night of August the 4th, they amount to a blueprint, a commitment to carrying out a demarcation between property and power. They amount to the destruction of that confused old regime system of, uh, of property and, uh, and uh, lay the basis for uh, an entirely new system. And so these, I've put here the four articles that I consider um, the key ones uh, in, uh, in making the night of August the 4th, uh, the, the night when the National Assembly committed itself to enacting a great demarcation. So if you look at article four, the suppression of seigneurial justices, and Article 7, the suppression of the venality of offices, well, there you have the abolition, you have the abolition of the two principal ways that individuals were able to own private, uh, were able to own public power as private property during the old regime. And if you then look at Article 1, abolishing the feudal regime, the feudal property structure, and Article 6, abolishing perpetual ground rents, which were non-feudal rents that had the exact same effect as feudal ones, uh, then you'll see that what these two articles do, Article 1 and 6, is they abolish the hierarchical system of divided property ownership, the system that of property holding that turned people into either dependents or superiors or both at the same time. In other words, articles one and six uh, dismantle the chain of, of hierarchical property owning that had existed before 1789. What do these, what do these, what do these two basic families of abolitions do in the end? Well, the abolition of seigneuries and venal office um, by abolishing the private ownership of public power, by abolishing the ownership of sovereignty, allows for the state to, re, to regather, to concentrate together and reconstitute all of these divided parcels of sovereignty into a new, unified, unique, absolute form of national sovereignty. Without the abolition of those forms of private ownership of public power, national sovereignty could not have happened. Similarly, without the abolition of, of, of the feudal property hierarchy and the non-feudal property hierarchy represented by the, by the rente foncière, it would have been impossible to create what the revolutionaries see as the necessary basis of, uh, of independent citizenship. And that is full, equal, independent property rights, modern property, property that an individual owns and holds from no one else and depends on no one else. The revolutionaries believe very much that that kind of proprietary individualistic independence is the precondition for, for, uh, for political liberty. Okay, the decrees of August 4th are, are, are great in theory, uh, but what about in practice? Uh, it, it's, it's one thing to decree uh, the entire system of old regime property and power abolished. It's another to actually carry it out. Um, most of my book is spent dealing with that, is dealing with how the revolutionaries actually carry out the program of the great demarcation that they commit to on the night of August 4th. I will go through it very, very briefly. The seigneuries are abolished without compensation. That is seigneurial justice simply abolished. And basically no one complains, not even the Lords. Uh, no one complains about that. So that's gone pretty easily, surprisingly easily with little debate. The venal offices, 
the, uh, the commercializable public offices. They are abolished with compensation. They're, the people who had purchased them are reimbursed by the state for, their, for, for the money they had laid out to purchase those offices. No one opposes that either. Everyone knows that the sale of public office is a very bad system. Um, so no one opposes that, especially since the owners of the venal offices are getting reimbursed. Uh, now, they, they end up getting reimbursed in Asinya, the paper money of the revolution. And uh, well, those, uh, those office holders who take their Asinya reimbursement and reinvest it quickly in property, such as the national properties that the revolution is going to sell, they do very well. But those office holders who take their reimbursements, who take their assignats and hold on to them, uh, suffer from the inflation that the assignat is going to is is going to experience and and lose much of their investment. So, some office holders do great, others do not. What about the the feudal dues and the ground rents? Well, to put it very simply, the National Assembly considers these kinds of dues and rents as legitimate forms of property. And as such, they, um, they, they uh, require that peasants reimburse uh, their lords for the value of those rights if they want to be freed from those rights. In other words, if you, if you, if you want to not pay feudal dues anymore and liberate your property completely and have full ownership of your property, you have to pay a pretty substantial amount of money that represents the capital value of those, of those annual dues that you pay uh, your lord. It turns out that the peasants can't afford that kind of money at all. There are, there are very, very few peasants with enough money to, uh, to reimburse their lords. And so what do they do? They simply stop paying their feudal dues. They don't pay their feudal dues at all. They don't reimburse them either. Um, they, don't, they don't pay taxes either for that matter. Um, uh, but um, eventually after a few years of, of futilely trying to get peasants to either pay the feudal dues or to reimburse their lords, the revolution gives up. It gives up and simply declares that all feudal dues are abolished without compensation. Now, there's a secondary argument that I trace in the book about, well, which dues are actually feudal and which dues are non-feudal ground rents. Um, and that is a whole other matter, uh, a complicated legal matter that goes on until the 1830s. I'm not gonna go into it, but all of this is simply to say that abolishing feudalism, abolishing the old regime system of property was complicated and it took a long time and it was a political process. Okay, one more thing uh, and then we're, then, we're, then, we're, then we're almost through. Um, the revolutionaries still see one problem ahead and that problem is that um, political bodies, quasi state actors uh, continue to own vast proprietary endowments the revolutionaries very much want to separate out sovereignty from property ownership. And from that perspective, the existence of political bodies like the crown or the church that own huge amounts of property, that's a problem because they are mixing political power and property ownership, which the revolutionaries uh, do not want. And so the revolutionaries go about, soon after August 4th, they go about beginning the process of ending the proprietary existence of both the church and, uh, and the royal domain. And in the process of doing this, they come up with a, uh, a really interesting and I think consequential theory of property. And, and here it is. Um, I'll let you, I think you can read this and I'll let you read this. The basic, the basic theory that 
that the revolutionaries use to end the proprietary existence of crown and church is to make a distinction between the property rights of individuals and the property rights of political corporations, of corporate bodies. And uh, Touré here uh, develops this argument in a brilliant, brilliant speech. I'm, I, I'm giving you a, a newspaper report about the speech that I think summarizes it very well. But the speech itself is, is, is really worth looking at because it is a radical, radical statement about the nature of property rights and one that absolutely denies corporations any kind of property rights at all, except those that uh, the legislature uh, choose to grant. And as Touré says here, any, you know, any property rights that, uh, that the law might grant to a corporation, well, the law can simply take away those rights uh, and there's no injustice whatsoever. Uh, this argument that Touré develops between the, the, the sacred um, primordial property rights of individuals that cannot, be, that cannot be interfered with by the law and the not at all sacred artificial property rights, the fictive property rights of corporations is used, is designed by him to uh, to uh, reclaim uh, possession for the nation of the property of the church uh, and uh, the royal domain. <clears throat> I say reclaim possession rather than take over or expropriate because according to this theory, which is quite influential in that the revolutionaries subscribe to, uh, there's no uh, expropriation or property transfer involved in the nation simply uh, reasserting its uh, control over its disposition of the properties of the crown and church. Because according to this theory, those properties always were, corporate properties always were, always had been, and always would remain fundamentally the properties of the nation uh, itself. And so here is uh, the Marquis de, or rather the Comte de Mirabeau, who, uh, who, uh, who says this explicitly. He's discussing uh, his motion to place the properties of the Catholic Church at the disposition of the nation. And he defends that against charges of expropriation and spoliation. He defends, uh, he defends this by saying, um, Ce n'est pas un nouveau droit que j'ai voulu faire acquérir à la nation. J'ai seulement voulu constater celui qu'elle a, qu'elle a toujours eu, qu'elle aura toujours. Constater. He's simply stating a fact. He's not taking over anything. He's not tr transferring property. And that is, that is the revolutionary, uh, that is the revolutionary theory of property that presides over, uh, over this uh, operation. Now, the properties of the church and the crown, they need to be taken over by something. And what they are taken over by is a new institution called, that the, that the revolutionaries call the national domain. The national domain, it still exists in France. Uh, it's an invention of the French Revolution. And it is invented by the revolutionaries primarily to, uh, to, take, to take over the properties, to take charge, I should say, of the properties of the church and uh, the crown. Now, many historians refer to this, this process by which the national domain takes over these corporate properties. Many historians refer to this process as nationalization. The, the nationalization of the properties of the church, the nationalization of the royal domain. Well, I, I think that's a very misleading word to use nationalization for two reasons. First of all, because uh, as the revolution, uh, there was no nationalization involved in what they were doing. Why? Because the properties that they were, that they were reclaiming the disposition of had always been national properties. They had never been anything else. 
you can't nationalize what is already the nation's. But more importantly, nationalization is a modern term that evokes ideas of planned economies, uh, massive like state control of property. And this is absolutely not uh, the role that the French revolutionaries envisioned for the national domain. What they saw their national domain doing was to take possession of these political properties, of these corporate properties, to take possession of these properties that, that, that inappropriately did not belong to individuals, but belonged instead to, to suspicious, fictive corporate bodies, the national domain was going to take charge of those, um, of those uh, corporate properties and then turn around immediately and sell those properties off to individuals, thereby transforming those fictive corporate properties into legitimate, sacred, individual, private property. In other words, we're not looking at nationalization here when we're looking at the national domain. When we're looking at the national domain, we're looking at a machine, a mechanism for converting corporate property into individual property. By the time all of that church property and all of that royal property had been sold, the royal domain, or rather, excuse me, the national domain would be essentially empty. The vocation, the destiny of the national domain was to empty itself out. It was simply a waypoint, a mechanism for converting a, a, an almost magical transformation uh, to, for uh, executing an almost magical transformation of property and, and making individual private property. I have one last quote for you. And this, this is it. This is again Touré. I can't overemphasize his influence, but here he is talking about the national domain and what it's going to do. Je pense qu'un des actes de, ré, de régénération les plus efficaces que la nation puisse exercer par l'autorité du pouvoir constituant est de retirer à elle tous les biens fonds qui n'ont point de propriétaire réel et de se mettre à porter par là de les faire rentrer successivement dans le patrimoine des familles. And that's what the national domain is for. And actually, just a little, a little anecdote, if you, look at, if you look on the internet for the French national domain today, you will see that its public facing web page, it's all about selling stuff. It's auctioning material um, that the state uh, can't use anymore, like old office equipment. Um, and so the French national domain is still uh, kind of about emptying itself out, or at least holding things that belong to the collectivity uh, rather than uh, individual people. That's very different than, say, if you look at England, if you look at the Crown Estate, which also has a website, it's, it's, it's not that. It holds a lot of property, a lot of private property, uh, and you can see that. So I'm going to conclude now, uh, and I think I'll be just about on time. So um, the French revolutionaries affected a great demarcation between property and power. They thought that that demarcation was necessary. It was absolutely essential for the creation of the new constitutional order they wanted to implement. First of all, it was necessary for equality. You could not have equal citizenship if some citizens owned uh, attributes of sovereignty, owned public power as their private hereditary property. Um, e equality in, implies equality of rights. And if some people are, are kind of mini sovereigns and others are subject to them, well, you don't have equality of rights at all. Um, by the same token, you can't have liberty if, if, if some people have power that others do not. And that if some people have proprietary superiorities uh, that they hold in perpetuity over other people. You can't have a world of, 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 of the dominated 
and the dominators and, and expect political liberty uh, to flourish. You can't have national sovereignty either if sovereignty is fragmented into thousands of pieces and owned by private individuals. And finally, you can't have elections if public power is a form of private property. How can you elect, what would be the point of electing public officials if public officials hold their office as a form of hereditary private property? The entire system of the revolution, everything they institute is, into, is completely dependent uh, on this demarcation between property and power. It creates, dare I say it, political modernity. It is the basis of political modernity. But it's more than that. Uh, the great demarcation, the demarcation that I'm talking about between property and power is also the basis of a whole series of conceptual demarcations, uh, a whole series of, uh, of binaries, uh, which we use today to understand and grapple with the modern world. So related to the great demarcation, perhaps flowing from it are other, are other conceptual demarcations between power and property, between sovereignty and ownership, between state and society, between the political and the civil, between the public and the private. And this whole series of, of conceptual distinctions um, form, uh, form a modern way of seeing, form the way that we certainly in the social sciences tend to uh, approach uh, the objects uh, of our investigations. So with that one minute late, I thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for letting me speak in English too, because my French is extremely rusty after 18 months without having visited. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafe. <laughs> your presentation was really interesting. Thomas, do you have any yeah. questions you want to share, yeah. Lucas? So, yeah, let me, well, I think your French is much less uh, rusty than my English, but <laughs> you know, let's, let's continue in English anyway. Yeah, I had two, two well, short questions. One is, you, you told us a lot about the lawyers that were sort of preparing the great demarcation long before the French Revolution. But in your book, you also talk about other uh, lawyers or other political actors or intellectuals who are uh, more skeptical about the great demarcation. And so in particular, the case of Montesquieu, I thought was particularly interesting because Montesquieu is viewed today as a, you know, someone uh, in, sort of in favor of the separation of power and sort of modern democratic institution. But as you show, I mean, he's so much for the, the separation of power that in fact, he wants to keep seigneurial justice because he's very afraid that the nationalization of justice uh, you know, could lead to a despotic system and could lead. So, so that's what makes the discussion complicated at the time is that you have also lots of people like Montesquieu or other actors who stress that, uh, uh, okay, property comes with power, but power comes with duties. And, and, and if, you, if you give a good local justice or if you provide good local public good, uh, security, education, after all, maybe it's better than a system with a, uh, you know, very greedy uh, property owners who don't care about the public good and a despotic centralized state at the top of all of that uh, controlling everybody. So, so they, they have some argument. And so my question is, to what extent, you know, you told us about the lawyers that were sort of in favor of the great demarcation, but so what about Montesquieu and other lawyers or, I mean, Montesquieu? And my second question, is also about the, again, to see the diversity of viewpoint in, in the debate of the time. So you, you told us, you know, the national domain was not nationalization. It was not a sovereign fund uh, uh, where, you know, we will use like in the sovereign fund of Norway today, we will use uh, interest income and rental income to pay for the welfare state or for schools or for public good or whatever. The purpose was privatization right away and to transfer it to legitimate private owners. But were there some people that were arguing otherwise? I mean, you had some people, but maybe peripheral actors like Thomas Penn, who was arguing sometimes, you know, for a capital endowment to everyone, which is not quite a sovereign fund. It's more a redistribution of property in little pieces to everyone. And were there some people who had more a sort of sovereign fund or, you know, national fund uh, 
kind of idea or was it completely not present at all in the discussion? There we go. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, great, great questions. Um, Ma, uh, let me start with Montesquieu. Um, yeah, he. Uh, it seems that his real aim is uh, is his real enemy. His real fear is concentrated despotic power and anything that will mitigate that uh, that that possibility. He's in favor of so. Hence, separating the you know creating an independent judiciary, um, uh, uh, you know the separation of powers. But uh, but yeah, as you point out, he uh, he explicitly defends the private ownership of public power in 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 all of its forms uh, in the opening pages of, of l'esprit des lois. Um, and there were other people who uh, who also defended that. But he is he is the only he is the only um, gosh I, I hate to say it he is the most thoughtful moderate I almost said intelligent one um, <laughs> there are there are a number of very rabid monar monarchists before the revolution people who want absolute unbridled royal power they want the king to be absolutely sovereign and to be the absolute property owner of everything in France. Um, there, there are more people like that. Um, they are so, the, 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 they're more um, plus royal que, que le roi. They, are, they, they claim things that the king himself doesn't claim. For example, people like this um, will argue against the, the, the various um, 16th century constitutional laws that limited the king's uh, power over, over, over the royal domain. Um, things, uh, laws that, that were intended to prevent the king from say alienating a province, selling a province to a foreign country. Well, there are real arch conservatives who say that these laws are wrong too. I mean, laws from the, from the, from the 1500s because they limit royal power and that the king is an absolute master who can do whatever he wants. Um, there's one of them in the National Assembly um, who argues against the creation of the national domain. His name is Galissonniere, and he makes claims that Louis XIV didn't even make um, for, for, for royal power. But the thing, the, I guess the reason, the, the reason why I, I, I focused on Montesquieu is because he had a, a compelling kind of liberal, understandable uh, rationale uh, for his defense of the private ownership of, uh, of public power. I have to say that I think I've, I lost at least one friend in, uh, in Bordeaux Trois because I wrote that, uh, you know, he's Montesquieu is seen in, in Bordeaux as very much the good guy, uh, but I, I don't think they wanted to hear that about that part of Montesquieu. Um, well, <laughs> So much for Montesquieu. As far as the the idea of the idea of um, creating a kind of national endowment yeah. uh, like Norway or uh, um, I have to I have to confess that I'm, my book is wrong. And in fact, what I just told you is is overly simplified. Um, the National Assembly takes over the properties of the church in, um, in November 1789. And in my book, I, I make it seem, and in the talk I just gave you, I make it seem as if um, in, 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 in placing those properties at the disposition of the nation, the deputies always intended, they intended immediately to sell all those properties off to individuals. In the research I'm doing now, which is, which is on the, the Bien Nacional, it's actually on this, the politics and finances of this alienation of national properties, what I found is that that is not a foregone conclusion. In fact, there are many different plans, many different proposals for how the nation 
can use the nationalized properties, uh, can use the properties of the church. And it's really only after uh, about eight months of debate and fis absolute fiscal emergency and financial crisis that the National Assembly really decides to actually start selling these properties. There are other plans such as using, using the properties of the church uh, as security for a massive loan that can be used to um, reconstitute uh, bad debt, to pay off rente viagère and uh, do other things such as that, or to sell only a small portion of the national property just to raise enough money to get France to a better financial position, but leave the rest of the church properties intact to fund public education, to fund hospitals, and even to fund uh, the, Catholic, uh, the Catholic worship. So in a word, yes, there are ideas of doing this. And I, I just gloss over them in my book, but there's a six month period at least after the nationalization in which all things are possible, including what you suggest. Mm. Um, Okay, so is that going to be a new book or article? Or? I, I think it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a book. Um, it's either, I'm, I'm in the process of, of researching it. Uh, it's, it's going to be a book about, uh, ideally, I wanted it to be a book on the sale of the Bien Nationaux, La Vente des Bien Nationaux, mm -hmm. um, which it's, it's a subject that's very well known in France. It was almost obligatory uh, some years ago for, uh, ma for master's students in, in French history programs to do their master's thesis on la vente des biens nationaux dans le département de... <laughs> um, but but what, I, what, I, what I came to realize is that none of, these, none of these studies actually look at either the... They don't look at the politics of the sale of the national properties. They don't look at why the National Assembly wanted to sell these properties or in financial terms, what it wanted to do with the money. In fact, this, the, the kind of the existing literature on, the, on la vente des biens nationaux, it actually focuses exclusively on l'achat des biens nationaux, on, on the social identity of the purchasers, but not on the biens nationaux as a political problem, as a political issue, a national political issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Olivia, you want to bring other questions? Sure. Uh, so we have a first question, which is, how was the French Revolution different from the American Revolution in the invention of property? Wow, um, that, is a, that is a really, really good question. Um, first of all, um, full-blown, well, two, two differences. First of all, in the American case, um, there was no um, there were no venal offices. You could not buy, you could not buy public office uh, as a legitimate form of property like you could in France. That system, that system of that, that formal legal system of, <clears throat> of venal public offices is actually unique to France. France is the only country in Europe that has this system, that has a system where you can buy a public office and it, 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 it attains the status of hereditary property. Um, England doesn't have it and the United States, the future United States doesn't have it. So that's not even an issue. The second issue is jurisdictional lordship, the, um, the, the seigneurial justice. That doesn't exist either in, uh, in the American context. Third thing that is different, the, this tenurial feudal property hierarchy. It exists in England and it exists in the future United States in a very attenuated form. And the reason why it exists in, a, in an attenuated simplified form is because um, the Norman conquerors of England, when they took over England, they, um, they, uh, 
they created a kind of blank slate. They found a country, you know, Anglo-Saxon England, they found, they found a country with a full-blown feudal system, but, the, but the, Norman, the Norman kings, William the Conqueror and his successors, they got rid of it and they established a more simplified kind of tenurial feudal system in which um, instead of having a, a very deep set of feudal layers, so king, duke, count, simple lord, um, th these, these Norman kings set up a system in which all uh, lords held their property, held their fiefs directly from the king. So there was only one level of feudal hierarchy in the English system. Um, and that's because of the opportunity that the Norman conquest gave uh, the, these, the, these Norman kings to remake the system in a way that would favor their monarchical power. As a result, England is a much more centralized country um, uh, early on than say France is. Um, so there is a kind of attenuated feudal system in the future United States, but the American revolutionaries, when they get rid of the king, when they, when they, when they get rid of King George, they actually eliminate the uh, superior level of that feudal hierarchy so that they aren't really left with much by way of, of a feudal hierarchy uh, at all. There are actually those still in the United States, a couple of areas where such a hierarchy exists. So for example, in the state of Maryland, Maryland was a colony that was given um, to, a Catholic, uh, to a Catholic lord, a Catholic English lord as a feudal landholding. In, in Maryland, there are still a perpetual rente foncière. There are still kind of quasi-feudal ground rents um, in, in that state. And I think in, uh, but that's because of the particular very feudal nature of that one colonial land grant. I think there are also similar survivals in the state of New York, but they go back to when New York was a Dutch colony um, and there were, there were land holdings given to kind of Dutch lords uh, there. Uh, but except for those, those very rare exceptions, uh, no, there's no, there's no feudalism. So it's very different. Basically, the American Revolution is a lot less revolutionary because it has a lot less, uh, it needs to change. It has a lot less old regime in a certain way uh, to, uh, to go up against. Okay, thank you very much. Um, also, what are the different factors or types of factors that culminated in the revolution against feudalism? Well, I mean, I think that they're different. They're different um, strands of critique against feudalism. So first of all, peasants. Uh, people in the countryside in particular who have to pay feudal dues, which are sometimes very heavy, that have to put up with all kinds of lordly privileges and prerogatives that are humiliating um, and, and uh, irritating, uh, they simply don't like it. Um, the people in the countryside do not like feudalism. And uh, as soon as the power of the central state begins to crumble in the French Revolution, why they simply rise up against it um, in a very sophisticated way. I mean, often the main target of a peasant anti-feudal uh, uprising is, is not the person of the Lord, it's the Lord's property documents. In the peasants, when they were, they burned more paper than chateaus. Uh, they simply wanted to destroy the traces of this very uh, heavy, burdensome, irritating property system. So the peasants have a very direct reason for not liking feudalism. There's another important line of critique that emerges in the second half of the 18th century from, uh, from political economy. Um, that, that would be people like the physiocrats, the economists. Um, they critique feudalism uh, because it stands in the way of economic rationality and progress. The various kinds of feudal dues, um, uh, as well as other sorts of privileges get in the way 
of the full uh, of the full economic development of, 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 of French agriculture and, and internal trade for that matter. And so people like Dupont de Nemours, they also hate feudalism and they, uh, they critique it, um, they critique it though often indirectly um, simply by inventing a new vocabulary, a vocabulary of propriété and propriétaire uh, that, uh, that, that kind of subtly erases the realities of the feudal, uh, the feudal world in which they are actually living. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question more legally oriented. Uh, what do you think is the impact of this great demarcation between power and property on the development, development sorry, of individual rights? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a, a very good question. Thank you. Um, I think that um, maybe, maybe this is what part of what Thomas was alluding to. I'm actually sympathetic toward the revolutionaries. They created a, the modern system of property, the system that Thomas calls, you know, the proprietarism, the, the system of individual property, a whole world, a whole social order based on the, the, you know, the autonomous individual property owner. And we know how that system turns out in the 19th century. It, it doesn't turn out so well. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's the basis of a great deal of inequality. Um, but um, I'm, I'm sympathetic toward the revolutionaries in 1789. I think that when they are inventing this system, when they are coming up with the idea of independent individual property um, it, it, protected from the arbitrary power of the state, they, they think that this is the way to ensure liberty and human development. Uh, they, 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 they do not see the dangers of what they are doing. Uh, instead, they are, they are looking at individual property, the individual property regime they're creating uh, against the backdrop of feudalism, against the backdrop of um, privately owned power uh, and lords and, and all this sort of thing. Um, and so for them, private property is the guarantee that the individual citizen will be free, will be individual, won't be subject to a lord, will have the uh, will have the wherewithal to um, to um, to express a a free and an honest political opinion. Uh, they don't see it as a source of inequality, uh, at least not initially. But I do have to say, like very quickly. Um, in the course of the 1790s, in the course of the revolution itself, they do come, at least some of them, come to, come to see that, that in destroying the aristocracy of feudalism, what they've left in place is an aristocracy of property that in some ways for them is even worse, possibly because it doesn't involve any, any, ob any social obligations. So there, there are some regrets later on, but I think at that initial moment of 1789, I really think they mean they mean the best. But as we but as we say in English, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, a question regarding colonialism: uh, How this, did this uh, demarcation between private and public property? Uh, induced external colonialism, and maybe how were uh, these lands and goods and people integrated into maybe the national domain? Okay, that's 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 a really wonderful question. Um, so uh, the uh, technically, um, all French colonies in 1789. That would be Saint-Domingue, Martinique, Guadeloupe, um, the, the Indian Ocean colonies. All French colonies are technically legally part of the royal domain in 1789. Uh, that is because they were, uh, they were acquired uh, after, after, uh, after, after the laws that had been, uh, after laws that had been passed in the, in the 1500s that had uh, that had uh, declared that the royal domain was inalienable. What that means is when the crown acquires these colonies, um, it cannot, the crown cannot uh, sell off, alienate, infudate uh, 
uh, the, the lands uh, of those colonies. And so actually, uh, when 1789 rolls around, all of the immeuble, all of the land in all of the French colonies belongs to the crown. It, it, is, it has been conceded under temporary revocable concessions to colonists, sometimes to religious orders, but it belongs to the royal, to the royal domain. And then after, uh, after 1789, the, the colonies, the land of the colonies belongs to the national domain. There are calls during the 1790s to sell off uh, colonial property as bien nationaux. There are calls to sell these properties off, these, these colonial properties off as bien nationaux, but actually um, none of it is ever sold. Um, the reason I think is simply because there is, um, as you know, there is, there is a slave revolution in Saint-Domingue where most of this property is located. And I think the revolutionary deputies realize that um, no one's going to buy, no one wants to buy a plantation in Saint-Domingue in 1795, uh, or, if they, if, or if they do, they will pay a tiny fraction of its value, uh, and that all that will happen by trying to sell the colonial properties is, uh, is to, squander, to squander this valuable national resource. Um, the, that could eventually be, be sold at, uh, at a profit. And so the lands uh, in the colonies are never sold. And actually that is a, that is a good question uh, for someone to research. Uh, when does, when, when, when are um, colonial um, lands, say in Martinique or Guadeloupe, transformed into private land holdings? I don't think that happens until the 19th century. Um, um, so I, I can't really answer this question very well because no one has studied it. Um, and okay, it's, it's well no known. worries. We also have, talking about uh, colonies, sorry, we also have a question about Algeria, uh, where the French arrived in 1830. Did it make a difference? I'm, I'm not sure, did, did what make a difference? Uh, the fact that the, the Algeria um, became a French colony after uh, the French Revolution. Again, a great a great question that I, I, I can't answer that one. I do believe, though, um, in just looking through um, in just some of the research I've done, I've seen legal documents about property contestations in 19th century uh, colonial Algeria. And I, I do think that that the French administration um, gave some, at least some place for local property law. I don't think that France came in and simply imposed uh, its system uh, lock, stock, and barrel on Algeria. Although that is really out of my uh, out of my uh, range of expertise. I know that there are law faculté faculté in France that work on this question, though. Thank you. Uh, now, Lucas Chancel also has a question. Actually, yeah. So my my question stems from from the the remark that what's also very striking from your talk and from your book is the speed at which all of this unfolds, and at least the relative speed at, at which a, a, a small group of uh, individuals uh, seeks to to change uh, to transform. So concepts and ideals into you know practical you know uh, a, a practical system. And my question is, what do we know about you know these people who made the law in 1789 and a few years after at the end of their lives? And do we have material in which they reflect on what happened and where they're happy with that and where they're happy with how? You know their ideals of the droit de l'homme transformed in practice at this point of time into you know practical law. Yeah, I I, I think that's a great great question, um, and it, it, it's a huge question because when when an old revolutionary like Merlin de Douai or Cambaceres, when they look back on their at the end of their lives, I mean they'd be looking back on all kinds of things, uh, not just not just how they transformed you know, property and the constitution, but also the political struggles they were in. I mean, these people are, uh, 
they're they're active politicians who are who are are, are really fighting um, you know a kind of life and death battle in the throes of revolutionary politics. If you lose, you could be dead. Um, and you know, they're they're trying to lead a country in crisis in the midst of war and revolution. So um, that's just a wonderful question in general. But as as for how this revolutionary generation looked back, I think that um, I can say that uh, more more precisely about about some of the property folks that I that that I follow, um, Cambaceres and Merlin, two two of the two of the revolutionary deputies, two of the revolutionary survivors who are in pretty much all the regimes from 1789 until the fall of Napoleon, um, who are also instrumental in enacting, um, in, in enacting this new vision of property, I think they thought the revolution went too far. I, I, I think that they, I get the sense when I read them, and they're both very accomplished lawyers, and maybe that's why, but I get the sense that they feel that they had put together a brilliant legal artifact in 1789. They had, they had made a beautiful legal construction um, that was going to carry France from the old regime to the new regime in, in a way that would be just and uh, but yet effective and transformative, but that the national convention, uh, the national convention goes too far. In, it undoes some of their work. It undoes their beautiful construction. And um, I think they they kind of regret that. They might have understood that that it wasn't entirely the convention's choice. I mean, there was a war. There was financial crisis. But someone like Merlin who is the architect of the original feudal abolition system, he, uh, he does not like the way that the convention uh, simply abolishes uh, feudal dues without any, uh, without any indemnification. In fact, in the, it's in the convention itself. He tries to, he's in the convention. He tries to fight it then. And, uh, and then later on when he's working for Napoleon in the Conseil d'Etat, he tries to fight it there and, and, and kind of turn back the clock. And till the end of his life, he is trying to argue that basically the system I made in 1789 was the right system. We went too far in 1793. I want to try to salvage as much as possible to go back as much as possible to the original system as I can. So I think there's some regrets. And I think you know, maybe there's a kind of lawyerly craftsmanship here, pride in lawyerly craftsmanship. You design such a beautiful law and it gets abolished just like that. What a, what a pity. Thank you very much, Rafe. Um, I think we'll have to stop now as it's already 7.30. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a stunning topic and presentation. Yes, thanks Thank a lot, Rafe. It was great, great to have you, and uh, we hope you know when you can travel again that you visit us, you know, and for your next book or even maybe before that, or you know. Can't wait! I can't believe me! I can't wait! I want nothing more than to, than to go to France. <laughs> Fascinating! Thanks so much, Rafe. Thank you. It was really, it was really fun, and I appreciate your questions. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Goodbye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye bye.